and welcome to Church of Cottonwood. And yes, here we are on the outside because for those of you who call Cottonwood home, we thought we would remind you. I didn't want you to forget about this place. We will be back here again someday. For those of you who are watching from around the world, you've probably seen the inside of the auditorium, but I thought I'd give you a tour of the outside. But even more than that, this empty parking lot, these empty parking spaces kind of represent what God wants to teach us this weekend. You know, each parking space is a car and each car is a family here at Cottonwood. And right now families are spread out all over and many of us as families are going through difficult times. But God has given us the principles and the keys to navigate these difficult times. He's given us hope and we're gonna learn about how we can navigate the hard times that we're living in now with the truth of what God's given to us. I wanna especially welcome two groups of you. For those of you who are our Spanish speaking community, we have special Spanish services for you. If you go to the website, you can just find out all about them that are there available for you in your language. And for those of you who are deaf and hard of hearing, we also offer American Sign Language for you, also available on the website. So go to the website. We're so glad you would join us for church. You know, every weekend we worship the Lord through song, we worship the Lord through the word, and we also worship through our giving. And I'm so grateful for your faithfulness and your faith in your giving. The easiest way you can do that right now, if you would just text Cottonwood to 77977, it's the easiest way you can do it. And you know, guys, I know it's a little technical, but know the spirit behind it, the gratitude, the generosity, the faith, even as you do that, be faithful in your giving and God will honor you. We're gonna have a great service inside the auditorium, outside around the auditorium. Let's worship the Lord together as a beginning place. Let's begin this service, giving him the glory he deserves through our worship. I'll be back soon, guys. Thank you for joining us for worship. Let's just get ready for the presence of God to invade wherever you are.
Hey church, uh, we've been in a series called Hope and uh, coming out of Easter, uh, each and every week we've talked about hope and the reason for that is because in the book of Peter we're told uh, that because of the resurrection, right, because of Easter, we now have a, a living hope in Christ Jesus. I love that, a living hope, a hope that does not fade, a hope that does not disappoint, a hope that does not crumble. And today I want to continue in that series and along that topic of hope and specifically I want to talk about hope in times of pain, hope in times of pain. I wanna take you to a very familiar passage of scripture in the book of James, James chapter one, uh, beginning in verse number two. I wanna read this to you, the New Living Translation. Um, all translations are great, but I, I really love the way the New Living frames this. So James chapter one, verse number two, it says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Did you catch that? Let's read that one more time. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Now, James, who authored this book, is an interesting character. Uh, he's the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, when it comes to New Testament history, uh, he is the first pastor of the, the church in Jerusalem, an influential church in the New Testament world. Uh, James was known as a man of prayer. As a matter of fact, so much so, uh, he developed large calluses on his knees. His contemporaries called him camel knees. And the reason he developed those calluses is because he spent hours and hours every day in prayer on his knees, beseeching God for his church and for his nation. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about James and him being a man of prayer and these calluses on his knees. And, and I began to think how sometimes at church I wear skinny jeans and those skinny jeans have rips in the knees and how sometimes people come up to me and make comments about how they probably need to give more in the offering so that I could afford some, some pants that don't have holes in them. And uh, the next time somebody makes fun of my jeans with holes in them, I'm just going to remind them that the reason my jeans have rips in the knees is because I've actually been on my knees for hours beseeching God, praying for them. So if you see me with holes in my knees, it's because I've been praying for you. But hey, throughout history, many women that have prayed have often been marked by the enemy. James was no different. As a matter of fact, uh, history tells us that he was martyred for his faith, that some assailants took him to the, the high point on the temple there in Jerusalem and threw him off in an attempt to kill him. Uh, but the fall didn't kill him. And as he lay on the ground, he, he prayed for his assailants as they came down and finished the job and began to beat him to death. So if anybody in the history of the world knows what it means to be a follower of Jesus, uh, if anybody is an authority on what it looks like to be a Christ follower amidst times of persecution, pain, and trouble, it's James. Um, as a matter of fact, if anybody can speak to our current state of the world, right, this current pandemic in the world, James could give us some proper instruction. He could give us some proper perspective, which is why I think we should actually lean in when he tells us in verse number two to count it all joy or to consider an opportunity for great joy when troubles come our way. And what I want to do today is take a couple of minutes and dive a little deeper into these verses that we've read and give us a couple of things to consider. And here's the first thing I want us to consider. The first thing that catches my attention in these verses we read is this, that there is a promise of pain. That as long as we are on the planet, there's a promise of pain. And I'm sure that's news that everybody loves hearing. But look at verse 2. Look at what James says. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, when Troubles come your way. When, not if, but when troubles come your way. James is letting us know that without a doubt, unequivocally, in this lifetime, we will experience pain. And more than likely, more than once. Notice that word trouble, it's plural, troubles. <laughs> Other translations say when you fall into trials of various kinds. Uh, we're going to fall into them more than once, and they're going to have different shapes and sizes. And I can hear somebody going, wait, wait, hold on. I thought that when I made Jesus Lord, he was going to just take away all my pain and he was going to make everything perfect and my life was going to be trouble free. I'm sorry, that that's just not the case. Um, and if you think that or believe that, uh, perhaps you've not been following Jesus very long. As a matter of fact, the opposite 
is the truth. Um, as we follow Jesus, we will for sure endure pain. We will for sure endure trouble. Now, let me just make this clear. Um, God is not the author of that trouble. In the middle of pain, in the middle of the season, even that we're living in the world right now, God is not the author of that. It does not equate to God being angry with us or God wanting to punish us for something that we've done. No, based on my understanding of the scriptures, based on, on the theology that I derive from the scriptures, I would say the opposite. God is not the author of our pain. As a matter of fact, you drop a couple verses down in verse 17 of James chapter 1. It says, every good and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there's no shadow of turning. There's no variance in him. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. When it comes to this idea of God being the author of pain, Jesus actually weighs in as well. John chapter 10 and verse 10, he said, no, it's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God has come, or I have come, Jesus said, that you might have life and life more abundantly. So if it steals, if it kills, if it destroys, it's not from God. Is from the enemy. God is not the author of our trouble. As a matter of fact, we just live in a fallen world, a world that's been overrun by sin. And because of that, we live with the consequences of sin. And trials and pain have now become a part of our human experience. God is not the author of our trouble. As a matter of fact, the scriptures paint a different picture. God is actually the author of our salvation. And God is so amazing in the way he operates. He actually is able to use our trial. He's able to use our pain and teach us how to draw near to him from it. He's able to take our pain and our trial and somehow get glory from it. We have this amazing promise in Romans 8 and 28 where Paul says, For we know that God is able to cause all things to work together for our good. He's able to cause all all things, I love that, all things, even pain, even trial, even the most messed up, confusing moments of our life, God's able to take all things and turn them for our good. Listen, following Jesus does not exempt us from pain. And if that's what somebody told you when you signed up for this thing, I I'm so sorry because they lied to you. As a matter of fact, Jesus says the opposite. In Luke chapter six, he says, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, and when they revile you because you follow me. Jesus again weighs in John 16 in verse 33. He says, in me you have peace, but in the world, as long as you are living on this sphere of a planet sucking oxygen, you're going to have trouble. You will have trials. Things will not always go your way. You will get offended. Someone will step on your toes. But he says, hey, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I'm the victor. And now because I'm in Christ, guess what? I'm no longer a victim. I have victory in Christ Jesus. Listen, following Jesus does not exempt us from pain and or trials. The apostle Paul said that if we're gonna partake in the good stuff, if we're gonna partake in the glory and the honor of Jesus, we also are gonna to have to partake in his suffering. Romans 5, he says, we glory in tribulations. We know that it is a part of following Jesus. So here's the truth. Following Jesus does not mean, it does not equate that there's gonna be an absence of pain in our lives, but rather what following Jesus does do, it gives us an unshakable hope amidst the trials and the storms of this life. It gives us a hope that somebody sees me. It gives me a hope that I'm not forgotten, that I'm not just some name on an endless list of names, that I'm not just some face, right, in this endless sea of people. No, God actually sees me and he knows me. I have a hope that there's help in the trouble, that there's health in the trial, that there's strength and there's rest, and there's a peace that passes all understanding that will guard my heart and mind. That's what following Jesus equates to. I have a hope that he sees me. I have a hope that there's a new day coming, that there's light at the end of the tunnel. I have hope that, yes, one day, God is going to make all things right. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy, it comes in the morning. God takes our mourning and our weeping and he turns it into dancing. God's able to take the ashes of my life and exchange them for his beauty. We have hope that there's a day coming where we will step into eternity, where we'll lay aside mortality, we'll put on immortality. We get a new body, a body like unto Christ, a body that is impervious to sin and death. It loses its hold, it loses its sting on us. We, we have this promise that one day we're gonna see our Savior face to face, that he's gonna wipe every tear from our eye and he's gonna right every wrong. He's gonna make every injustice right. Following Jesus does not exempt us from the trials and the storms of life. But following Jesus does give us an eternal hope as we weather the, the storms of this life. I heard an old preacher say it like this, storms don't last, but saints do. I love that, storms don't last, but saints do. 
in this life, we do have the promise of pain. But in Jesus, we have a living hope, a hope that endures. It is true that pain is a reality this side of eternity. And so we need a different perspective on pain because we have the Lord with us. I'm standing outside of building C because we name our buildings really creatively here at Cottonwood, A, B, and C. But this is our kids' building. And on a typical weekend, there would be hundreds and hundreds of children worshiping God. And this building doesn't just represent kids, it represents families and the idea of pregnancy, which I think is a great metaphor for the perspective we should have. You know, being pregnant, giving childbirth, it's a painful experience at times. But through it, the most glorious result takes place. And that's the perspective of pain that the scriptures give us, that it is a reality, but when we have a different view on it, we know God is going to do something glorious through it. As Harrison continues teaching his word, open your hearts and your minds that whatever pain you're going through now, have a perspective that God's going to do something glorious through it because of his goodness in your life. Let's jump back to the word now. So we know that in this life, we have the promise of pain. So the question becomes, what do we do with it? How do we endure amidst the pain? So we go back to our text. I would suggest that James, our author, is, is saying that the way that we endure the promise of pain is by taking the prescription for the pain. And that's the second thing I'd like for us to consider from, from our text is that there's actually a prescription for the pain. Look at verse 2 one more time. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy, joy. I'd like to suggest to you that the prescription for the pain is joy. Book of Proverbs chapter 17 says it like this, that the, the merry heart or the joyful heart, it does good like a medicine. So James, I believe, is saying that the prescription for the pain is joy. Now, I realize the statement that I just made there because some of us, we, we hear that and immediately we go, wait, hold on. I am facing the biggest trial of my life. This is the most difficult season I've ever lived through. I'm stressed out. I'm overwhelmed. I may have lost my job. I may have lost my health. The future is bleak at best. And you're telling me that in the middle of all of this, I'm supposed to be joyful. I realize that that's the statement I just made. You know, a few years ago, a very close family friend of my wife and I she had a miscarriage in the middle of her pregnancy, and she lost her baby. And what was supposed to be a season marked by joy was actually marked by pain and grief. And I look at that, and I look at what James is writing, and I go, wait, hold on. James, where's the joy in that? Just over a week ago, at the time of this filming, a very close pastor friend of mine uh, lost his life due to a self-inflicted gunshot wound, leaving behind four kids and a wife and a bunch of friends, myself included, that are now left to kind of pick up the pieces and process life after his death. And I look at that scenario, and I consider the emotions going on even within me, and then I read James chapter 1 and verse 2, and I go, James, um, where's the joy in that equation? Where's the joy for the man whose wife just got diagnosed with terminal cancer? Uh, where's the joy for the addict who, after years of sobriety, now because of the pressures surrounding this COVID situation, has fallen off the wagon and gone back into heavy substance abuse? Uh, where's the joy for the single mother who, who is trying to raise three kids on her own and is trying to hold down two jobs and trying to make rent but lives in fear every month of being evicted? Where's the joy? in that scenario? Where, where's the joy for the faithful spouse who after years of faithfulness has found out that their spouse has not been faithful to them? Where's the joy for the small business owner that's had to shut their doors and lay off their staff because of a, a global pandemic and unclear government oversight? Where's the joy? Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. I read that and I go, James, um, are, you, are you serious? And maybe it's just me, but sometimes when I read the scriptures, at least on the surface, at first glance, uh, the Bible sometimes doesn't make a lot of sense. 
again, I read this and I go, James, like, I, I, I acknowledge your credentials. I, I see your expertise here, but I think just maybe you missed it this time. Like, I don't think you quite understand what you're saying, what you're writing, because for me, uh, joy is not like a light switch that I can just kind of flick on and off when I need it or when it's appropriate. Right, like we feel that way sometimes. Like, James, how am I supposed to count it all joy? If you knew the trial I was going through, if you knew the pain that I was experiencing, if you could see what I'm seeing, would you really say count it all joy? But here's the thing. I'm actually wondering if maybe when James tells us to count it all joy or consider uh, trials as an opportunity for great joy, I, 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 I'm wondering if maybe he's not telling us to just sort of turn off our emotions, pretend like nothing is, is happening. I actually think he might be instructing us to run towards something that's much deeper than an emotion, much deeper than a feeling. What if James is actually encouraging us to run towards a person? And not just any person, uh, but to the one. The one who's actually the embodiment of all joy. To run to the one, to the person who in his presence, the scriptures say, there's a fullness of joy. What if James is telling us that in times of great trial, we should run to Jesus? We should run to the Savior. Charles Spurgeon, who was a famous preacher 150 years ago, he said this, I've learned to kiss the wave that continually slams me into the rock of ages. Jesus is that rock of ages. And what, what is Mr. Spurgeon saying here? He, he's saying, look, I've learned to be grateful for the trial because it's the trial that continually brings me back to the feet of Jesus. And if we're considering trials as opportunities for great joy, and we know that that joy in the trial is not something that we can self-manufacture, where do we get it from? How do we experience that joy? What does it look like practically for us to experience this joy? You know, I been thinking about this a lot, asking myself, asking the Holy Spirit, like, hey, I, I want to run to Jesus in the midst of, how do I do that? Like in the midst of pain, when I can't get my eyes off of anything except for the, the, the pain that I'm feeling, how do I run to Jesus? How do I tap into this joy? And as I've been considering this, the Holy Spirit brought me back to the Old Testament, the story of Job. Many of you would be familiar with, with his story. Job is a famous Old Testament character. He's sort of become the poster boy for, for suffering and for experiencing pain. And if you're not familiar with this story, here it is in a nutshell. In the matter of a day, Job loses everything. He loses his children. He loses his house. He loses his wealth. He loses his possessions. And ultimately, he loses his health. He, he says, the things I feared most in the world have actually come upon me. And if anybody in the history of the world can speak to enduring during pain and trial, it's, it's Job. And he goes through this whole series, and at the end, God restores everything back to him. And as I began to read through his story and consider his story, I couldn't help but wonder, Job, what was the first thing you did when you began to experience that trial, when you began to walk through that storm? How did you respond initially? And I went back and I found the answer and it floored me. Job chapter one and verse 20. This is what Job did. He's just lost everything. And it says, Job stood up and he tore his robe with grief shaved his head and he fell to the ground to worship. To worship. In the midst and in the face of pain, the first thing that Job did was he worshiped. Hear me. In the midst of life's most trying moments and times, Joy is not something that we can just sort of self-manufacture. No, we actually have to go to the source. It must be given to us. A supply of joy must be given. We must tap into the source. Well, where is this source of joy found? It's found in the presence of Jesus. Psalm 16 and verse 11, David writes, he says, God, in your presence, there's a fullness of joy. Okay, so we know that joy is found in the presence of God. Well, how do we access the presence of God? You're going to see a recurring theme here. Number one way we access God's presence through worship. David, the psalmist, again writes Psalm 22 and verse 3 says, God, you're holy and you're enthroned on the praises in the worship of your people. And that word enthroned literally means to take up residence. It means to take up dwelling. It means to inhabit a space. So David is saying, God, when people begin to praise and when they begin to worship, you invade that space. You take up a dwelling place in that space of praise 
in worship. And, and, and for those that have experienced the presence of Jesus, you know what I say when I, when I go, hey, look, it just changes everything. There is just something about the presence of Jesus. It realigns my attention. It realigns my focus. It puts my focus where it belongs. And I'm reminded there in the place of his presence that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Now, I want to do something right now, and I, I realize that this can be a little awkward, but we're going to together embrace the awkwardness. I'm going to ask you to lift your hands. I want to put this point into practice now. I want us to take the prescription for the pain. I want us to tap into that source of joy. I want us to access the presence of God. In his presence, there's a fullness of of joy. I want you to just lift your hands with me. And I realize you might be sitting in your living room right now. You might have your kids around you. I, I don't know. This might be awkward for some of you. When you actually like came physically to church, you never lifted your hands. I'm going to ask you just to do this as your pastor. I'm going to ask you to just lift your hands. It helps you close your eyes. But the reason we're lifting our hands, it's just our way of submitting before God. It's our way of saying, God, there is a God and, and it's not me. It's you. And I live in submission to that. And as you just lift your hands and as you close your eyes, I want you to begin to fill your mouth with worship, with praise. Begin to say, God, you're lovely and you're worthy and you're holy. Just for a few seconds, just begin to fill your mouth with praise. Our, our worship team, I'm going to invite them in just a moment to come lead us in a song. But before they do, I think it's important that we begin to lift up our own praise and our own worship. Just say, Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for rescuing me. Thank you that you're with me, that you're present in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the pain. Thank you that even in the midst of uncertain times, Father, you remain the same. I come back to the certainty of your nature and your character. You're faithful. Your promises are forever settled and you're worthy of my worship. Just begin to tell him how much you love him. Jesus, we love you. We're so grateful for your presence. Thank you that you're not left us alone. You've given us your word. You've given us your people. You've given us your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence. We worship you in this place. Just as you begin to lift up your own song, as you begin to lift up your own worship and adoration toward Jesus, if you, if you will lean into these moments, I promise you heaven will invade that space. If you lean in, you will begin to access the presence of God. You'll begin to tap into that supply of joy. I'm going to ask our worship team to come now and and help lead us in song. And uh, as we do, again, let's press in and let's experience the joy that's only found in the presence of Jesus. Should I be? 
explain how I'm building up the courage to trust in you again. I know, Jesus, you are with me. Jesus, you are with me. Oh, yes, you are. Jesus, you are with me. It is true that Jesus brings us joy to help us navigate the hardships of life. And oftentimes he does that through people. I'm standing here on our plaza by our coffee shop where on a typical weekend hundreds of people would come together and we'd drink coffee and we would share our stories and we would pray for each other and Jesus would bring us joy through each other. He uses people to be present in our lives. And if you're listening to me right now, if you've heard Harrison's teaching, even though we still have one segment left, but you know Jesus is tugging on your heart and you need in your life to navigate the hardship, listen, I want you right now to text the word HOPE to 411247. If you text the word HOPE to 411247, on the other end of that text is a pastor. You don't have to be alone. The pastor will pray with you, listen to you, give you some direction and guidance so that you can receive the joy of the Lord through people. One day, we'll gather again and have some coffee. But today, we don't have to be isolated so that Jesus can be present with us. Let's jump back now to the conclusion of Harrison's teaching. All right, so we got the promise of pain. We got the prescription for the pain, which is joy. I'm gonna talk to you now about a third area third thing I want us to consider is this, that there's actually a purpose in the pain. So the promise of pain, the prescription of pain, and now there's a purpose in the pain. Look at verse number three. Look what James writes, James 1 and verse 3. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Here's the purpose in the pain. That when we actually emerge from the trial, we emerge with an enduring and a steadfast faith. And I want you to notice this, that it's in times of pain, it's our faith that's actually being tested. James says, for you know that when your faith is tested, it's our faith that's under attack. And faith being the belief that God's real, the, the, the belief that, that God is good, that God is faithful to his word, that God's able to do what he says that he will do. The faith is the belief that God is, is able to see and control what's going on in my world. The, the biblical definition of, of faith is faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not yet seen. And I find it interesting that of all things to be under attack, it's our faith that the thread that the enemy wants to pull at is our faith. You see, it's by faith that we live and are redeemed and are saved. It's by faith that we draw near to God. It's by faith we're brought near to God. So it's of no wonder why the enemy would target our faith as his point of attack, because if he gets our faith, he gets everything. But isn't it just like God to take the scheme of the enemy and to flip it on its head and to, what the enemy meant for evil, God can turn it into Good. You see, by attacking our faith, the devil, in fact, gives us an opportunity to exercise our faith. And you know what happens when you exercise? You get stronger. Let me maybe paint it like this. Um, since we've been um, under lockdown, some call it house arrest, what, what have you, as we've been under lockdown, um, I realize I've had to take it upon myself to find new ways to exercise. I can't exactly go out and go to the gym. Uh, and so I've decided, you know what, I'm gonna start doing some, some old fashioned exercise. I'm gonna start doing some sit-ups and some push-ups. And I, I had in my head that, yeah, I'll just sit down real quick and I'll do 50 push-ups, I'll just knock them out. Um, yeah, push-ups aren't as easy as I remembered them being. And, and you know, true story, I got through about eight. And I was like, yeah, we might get through 50 today, but we're gonna do eight right now. And we're gonna take a little couple minute break before we, we jump back in. And I began to have to do 50 push-ups in sets of 10 and throughout the day. But then the next day I, I was able to do a few more. I did two sets of 15 and then two sets of 10. And every day I was able to add a little bit more. So I had this goal of 50 push-ups a day. After about three days, I was able to do two sets of 25 and be, be done with it for the day. And so I've upped my goal. Now next week, I wanna do 75 push-ups a day. And then the week after 100, and then all the way up to 200 push-ups a day. But you know what I'm noticing is that 
as I do this consistently, as I exercise my muscles consistently, my muscles are getting stronger, my endurance is growing, and I'm able to do more push-ups. Listen, I hope you're seeing the picture I'm trying to paint here. It's the same with our faith. As our faith gets exercised in seasons of trial, it actually produces endurance. It produces steadfastness within us. And not the kind of endurance that a high school senior shows when they're sitting in their sixth period class of the day waiting to go home. You know, I'm just going to endure this guy so I can go home and play Fortnite. That's not the kind of endurance I'm talking about. I'm talking more about the steadfastness and the endurance that a marathon runner would, would exhibit when they're getting to crunch time and they're about to hit the wall where, where they feel like they got nothing left to give. And then yet somewhere deep down from this well on the inside they didn't even know was there, they, they find this will and this grit and this determination to push forward. That's the kind of faith, this steadfast faith that's actually being developed in us in seasons of pain in our life. And I, I believe this, that God is even wanting to use this current season of the world, this COVID pandemic, to further develop the faith of his people so that when we emerge from this trial, our eyes aren't going to be on the government for security. Our eyes aren't going to be on our jobs to provide a sense of identity, but rather our eyes will be where they belong to focus on Jesus, where we'll have an even greater and a deeper level of faith that cannot be shaken, where we'll be able to say, look, come, come whatever season, man, do what you will to me. Come hell, come high water, I will not be shaken because God is faithful. God is good. His word is true. His promises, they're forever settled in heaven. His kingdom, it's unshakable. His church has a voice and it has a mission in the world. And my life matters in bringing a living Jesus to a dying world. That is the type of steadfast faith that God is wanting to develop in us in seasons of pain. And friend, I just want to encourage you. There is hope amidst the pain in this life. Undoubtedly, we have the promise of pain. Trials will come. But there's a prescription for the pain. Joy. And that joy is not self-manufactured. It's only found in one place. It's found in the presence of Jesus. And it's there from that vantage place of joy. We realize that there's actually a greater purpose in the pain. That God is at work in us and that our faith is actually growing stronger as a result. As I get ready to wrap this up, I want to just leave you with some lyrics that were written by a very close friend of mine. I feel like they're appropriate for the season of life that we're in right now. He said this, don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high. Don't fear no evil, but fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. I'll tell you where our help comes from. It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Psalm 121, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord. Church, I want you to know that there is hope amidst the pain. God sees you. He loves you. He's with you. And if he's with you, that means he's for you. And if he's for you, nobody can be against you. Love you very much, church. See you soon. That is such good news that God brings us strength through us as we navigate pain and the hardship of life. And that strength enables us to walk in his joy and his victory, enables us to be prepared for what he has to do for us. I'm standing outside of Building B. Some of you may recognize Building B because it's where Cottonwood College meets for its classes. And I've got really exciting news for you. This fall, Cottonwood College is launching a daytime program in conjunction with Southeastern University. They're offering full, fully accredited degrees for those of you who want to come to a daytime program. There are many good Christian colleges in this area. But what makes Cottonwood College perhaps a bit unique is that one, it's going to be smaller. So your intimacy, your classroom size, the opportunity to interact even with faculty is very powerful because of the smaller size of the student body. Secondly, it's church-centered. So you're not just in classrooms, but you're actually engaged in ministry and you're interacting and having the opportunity to learn as you do ministry. And then thirdly, practically but honestly, it's probably a lesser cost than some of the other private institutions may be. If you're interested in the possibility of earning a degree through Cottonwood College, through Southeastern University, text the word LEARN to 411247 and you can get all the information you need about that. You know, it's been an amazing weekend where we have learned about how God ministers to us even when we're in pain. 
You know, during this COVID season, we realize there are important issues we need to be talking about and looking in the scriptures for. Issues that relate to our soul and our psychology and our emotional state and our spiritual state. So we're starting a very special series this Wednesday night. It's called Conversations on the Couch. And we're gonna be looking at issues like anxiety and family and depression and soul care. We're gonna be bringing in specialists, Christians, who really have an expertise and can speak into it, giving us coaching to understand and to navigate it for our own lives. I wanna encourage you this Wednesday, join us for Conversations on the Couch as we look at anxiety and understand how we can overcome that through Christ. It's an amazing time when we get together on the weekend, isn't it? Even though there is pain, Jesus brings us joy. It's gonna be a reality, but God makes us strong through it. We worship him through the word and he deposits something in our heart. We worship him in song. We also worship him in our giving. Remember, you can text the word Cottonwood to 77977 and you can give your offering and your ties to the church. Let God be with you this week in a way that brings a joy and a strength to you. And we'll see you on Wednesday night for conversations on the couch. God bless you guys.